So, um, good afternoon. I'm John, CEO of Smile Family, and let's get started. Okay, uh, a couple of years ago, when I came back from work, my wife pulled out this picture of ultrasound. And she said, honey, I'm pregnant. You know, that moment, you know, a million thoughts just rush through your head. You start to panic. You're like, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do? But you take a deep breath and you know, say, tell yourself, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, I'm going to be ready for this. But when your baby actually pops out, you know you aren't ready. Endless crying, you know, sleepless nights, breastfeeding, everything is just chaos. And my wife and my sister went through something called po postpartum depression, which just added a whole new level of disaster. So, you know, she, she said she felt like I was trapped in the prison of childcare, and I couldn't agree more. So each night when I came back from work, I used to have chats with her, and she would always have her smartphone in her hand, looking at something. So I asked her, you know, honey, what are you doing with your phone? And she said, you know, as a mom, you have to constantly search and read stuff on parenting and talk to other moms to get more tips. She said, like, smartphone is like a window to the world outside. And that phrase really made an impression on me. So I started to do some research. And it turns, moms love mobile access. 64% of moms in the US are on smartphones, compared to 53% of non-moms. And there are roughly a third of the population are moms. So there are a lot of moms using smartphones these days. But why do moms love smartphones so much? Well, it turns out, if you're a mom, it's pretty obvious why you'd prefer smartphones to a PC. This is a picture I found on one of the mom communities. She's you know, breastfeeding while watching YouTube. Well, it's hard to imagine mom taking care of her child and sitting in front of a PC. So smartphone is a smart choice for moms. And what about babies? Well, there are 54 million babies in the US under the age of 12, and 4 million are being added to that market each year. And moms love spending money on their, on their kids. Roughly hundreds of billions of US dollars are spent on their children each year. And if you extend it a little bit further to mom's market, it's $2.1 trillion. I can't even imagine how big that is. And considering that this market is a combination of offline and more of a traditional PC-based online market, it would be very interesting to see how much of that market will shift over to the mobile side in the coming years. So we tried to figure out what was really happening on the mobile space for moms. So we downloaded all the prominent apps on Google Play and iOS. And frankly, we couldn't really find the one app that we really wanted to use, which was basically parenting and community in one nice little package. For instance, uh, Baby Center, which is more popular apps, uh, is fo focused a lot more on pregnancy rather than afterbirth parenting. And it's more of a one-way information delivery app rather than a community service. So that's why we decided to make one for ourselves with Smile Family, with a mission of making families happier every day. And with Smile Mom, we want to make moms happier every day by providing parenting community. So for parenting, we want to be able to record the special moments of raising our child and be able to share those stories with other mom friends and family members and get relevant parenting information without having to search through all the mixture of keywords, just get the right information when you need them. And also connect with other mom like yourself to discuss more on those parenting tips. So to start off, we offer something called Smart Baby Book, which is basically an album, but has smart guides that tells you what to expect and record. For instance, if your baby is five months old, it will tell you, hey, your baby's about to flip over. Why don't you record a special moment on a video? So you can track your baby's development milestone just by filling the album. Second, we offer curated parenting information, which is basically parenting tips according to your child's growth. For instance, healthcare, what kind of vaccination you should be getting and when? Education, what kind of books your child should be reading now? And lastly, lastly, community. So you can find moms who live nearby and have children with similar ages. So basically, you can find moms in your area to have play dates. And the business model is pretty straightforward. By leveraging the already existing parenting information system, we can not only recommend parenting advice, but also products and services. So we can do targeted advertising and targeted commerce. And who's making all this? Our key, pe pe key people are from Paprika Lab, which is a previous company that I founded and was acquired by Gree last year. So we have four founders, eight people in total, have raised 10 over a million dollars in seed funding. But what's more important is that most of us are parents. So our goal is to get every mom to use Smile Mom on their smartphones. Thank you for listening. Are we supposed to make yeah, comments? Yeah. Any, any comments or questions? I would love, as, I mean, I am 
the I think the only one here who has two children under two, so like I should be squarely in your demographic. I think um, I think you're absolutely right about the smartphone angle. Um, on weekends, I literally don't open my laptops, but I am doing absolutely everything from my smartphones, and I cannot imagine having two young kids and not having a smartphone. So like, I think that's like so right on, and a lot of people aren't thinking in that direction. And I think you're also right on in that most parenting apps are awful. Um, but I think to me as a mom where your direction misses the mark is I think you can't be in the battle for recording moments because people are already doing it elsewhere. They're already doing it on Facebook where they have bigger sharing. They're doing it on Twitter. There's a, and there's, I'm, I do it a lot on Instagram and I just sort of, or people are doing it on Path or, you know, there's family social networks and it's like, there's so many other companies, like there's about 10 that I've been pitched on in the last year that are like also trying to solve the like sharing pictures with your family, sharing moments, capturing moments, organizing. It's like, and, and none of them quite work because people are already doing it in other places. So. I think that that's like a real danger area. Um, Honest, which is, you know, Brian Lee and Jessica Alba's company released an app. And in some ways the app is great for like when you're, you know, nursing and tracking and tracking feeding. But in terms, I mean, I have it in my pocket. I use the app, I use the app all the time and I still didn't record milestones in it when I would be at the doctor's office. I just, yeah. that it, is, it is a really, really, really hard behavioral thing to do and it's crowded and, and there's a reason people aren't doing it well. That having been said, I, I really like the prompting aspect. I don't think anyone's doing that. And I think that's what Baby Center did so well in the pregnancy phase was like sending you, you know, your baby's the size of a grape. So like, if you insist on going towards milestones, I would really focus on the prompting. Like your child's about to roll over. Here's a really great book your child would love this age. Cause I don't think that exists, that call to action and push notification to keep pulling people back into the app. Cause even the honest one is gorgeous and it's well designed, but it worked for me for two months and then I abandoned it. Cause even though we're on our smartphones, we're on our smartphones who are feeding children and chasing children. And so I'm doing like mission critical things on my smartphone. Yeah, oh. I, I, no, I tend to agree. Like, I'm a big fan of, you know, companies trying to build things for for moms and parents. Because as a mom, you know, totally agree. I, I just feel like I've seen a lot of these companies that are like record moments of your your child, and it feels like an, an, another step. And if you think about moms are very busy, or you know, parents are very busy. It's like now I have to you know use the app to you know track moment. Like, and I probably wouldn't use it. I'd probably just use other tools. Um, so that's. Yeah, just, and anything where it's like around recording moments, and it's just, it's very challenging. Like all the companies I've seen that are doing that, they nothing has taken off. Even I think some of the big brands that have launched apps like that, like I don't think it's gone anywhere. Um, and my biggest question for these types of apps that are kind of like trying to build community among parents when there already are big incumbents, is like how do you make money off of this? Like I, it wasn't clear to me, and I also didn't know if this was live. Maybe we're all wrong, and you have like 10 million users already. But and also, I do not consider child care to be a prison. I actually look forward to Saturday and Sundays when I get to spend all day with my kids, so I might not be the demographic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just to jump in for a sec, um, I think that's a very legitimate question, an excellent question to ask. That's what we've been actually trying to figure out. And one interesting aspect is that we've observed something similar in Korea, um, probably even earlier than the United States. We have something like a mobile social network, which is actually a bit more popular than Facebook. It's called Kakao Story. And it's interesting that moms are actually separating out their social graph from Facebook because Facebook is for like coworkers and you know, your high school friends and you don't really want to share all your baby pictures with your, your like daily coworkers. So they want to figure that out, you know, separate that out and just make mom friends or other family members as friends and share more private pictures there. So I think there is a clear need for like a separation of social, um, uh, social graph. It might, might not be the case in the States, but that's what sort of our uh, one of our key premises. And another interesting aspect is that, like, uh, like you just mentioned, like push notification and how regularly, but not really stressing out those milestones is uh, one of the key ingredients that we, we are trying to figure out. And what's, what's really promising for our app is that some of the users who just signed up, who were using like Facebook before, they just uploaded like, hundred, like 300 photos within like five days so, on, onto our album. So they're clearly, we, we believe that our app has a, maybe a better user experience. We're still improving on it, but 
same thing with Drop Dropbox. There have been million file sharing apps, but only can I people can I give Dropbox, some feedback so. because we have yeah. two minutes? Uh, okay. So number one, I'm actually an investor in Baby Bump, which was one of the listed competitors, yeah. mm -hmm. which I think one of the most important parts of uh, this uh, uh, aspect during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, I'm surprised that the moms didn't bring it up, but you have a team of four people mm -hmm. uh, that are all men, and you don't have a chief mommy officer. Uh, uh, I think we I would have, at least miss the wives as uh, an advisor. The third thing is, um, I think this is a very like future-oriented solution to the problem, mm -hmm. and it's not really addressing the problem. So one thing that I've seen, having a one-year-old, four-year-old, pregnancy is the biggest thing, mm -hmm. where like a lot of moms change purchasing decisions and their lives are changing and during pregnancy. The second thing is, the biggest problem after pregnancy is actually medical. So we also backed a company called First Opinion, which is trying to create a network where a lot of times, first time parents, like even myself with two graduate degrees, if we didn't have a nanny that is really experienced, we would have been in the emergency room almost every night. So just approaching the simplistic problem of doing the photos and the moments that people are already doing in other places, I feel you're doing your team a little bit injustice, like you guys are capable, but you need to solve a much more critical part of the problem in a more unique way. Yeah, I was, I was about to bring up the same thing, which is mission-critical utility. Mm -hmm. So figure out how you can give me access to the key things I want to know as a parent, because I don't have time, either because it's an emergency or, or emergency, or, you know, I just don't want to go and search many, many things. So figuring out that funnel, and yes, you know, taking pictures or whatever might be relevant for you. In the U.S., I think there are networks to do that. But I, I was, like, like Adam, I was shocked that you didn't have, you know, uh, a woman co-founder. Because I would expect this company to have, like, three females and one dude. I okay. have a token woman founder for the sake of it. I mean, I see so many mom apps where, like, they've bolted a woman on. I mean, I'd rather see four dudes who are actually doing it. Uh, we and actually being honest have moms the on our founders. company, but we were just four founders well, from the our least pre previous company. Dad. So, <laughs> And um, one interesting aspect is that, um, actually, I, I was talking to David Ways, the CTO of Baby Center, the other day, and he mentioned that, Early in the pregnancy, from previous nine months to about one year old, mom, uh, moms, you know, tend to go for more of anonymous and are more towards expert content like medical advice. But after like one to two years old, that need sort of really drops off, and they actually change towards social uh, social needs like play days, you know, what kind of like play groups or like soccer soccer teams or what kind of like, communication you want to do with those parents. I'll just so. say, I'm an, a huge early adopter. Mm -hmm. I would never go online to find people to have play dates with. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's I okay. I mean, I mean it's maybe it's a US yeah. thing, maybe it's me. I don't know, yeah, I just, maybe it's I'm for a, some people, I am like so not freaked out by the web, but I would not do that. Yeah, I would, I would actually <laughs> say, as opposed to going for play dates, I would go for, you know, children who have sort of disabilities or people who have, oh, my, my child has this type of issue and so on and so forth. Who can give me a sense of what happened and what they did? Because you're not going to meet that kid at the park. Yeah. And, and that is where, you know, the internet and support, it's much more of a support group, uh, can be really powerful. Okay. And one other advice, you talked about postpartum. I, I think one thing that I realized, I had the great fortune for the first pregnancy Mike. to have actual... Oh, Mike. Yeah, Mike. To have actual time with my wife, so sometimes we need less smartphone and more real in-person communication, especially with our families and significant others. But I think still the idea is really great, and clearly we made two investments, so we believe in the market. Okay. Well, thank you. I guess. Good luck, y'all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so next up is uh, Kelvin Kim from ID Inku. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. This is really crowded, huh? Where is my slide? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Kelvin, representing IDNQ Corporation. And what we are providing is Open Survey, which is the number one mobile research platform in Korea. I'm sure that you must heard of these company names at least once before. Is there anyone in this room who haven't heard of it? Yeah, everyone knows. 
with what Nielsen do and what Hunter do. So let me share an episode with Nielsen that triggered Open Survey. Three years ago, I was a product manager of a software company, and I was responsible for a new consumer product, so I literally needed market research. So I hired a, a number of research firms here, and I was so shocked that market research was extremely expensive. I should pay thousands of dollars to get the result. What's worse, I had to wait a month to deliver the result. So it is no wonder that sometimes the information the market research provides is inaccurate due to a huge time gap between the customer responses and the analyzing part. So I did believe that market research should and must be affordable, fast, and accurate for everyone. So February 2011, IDNQ, my company, has established to challenge this problem. This is the demand graph by project revenue and client's number. The red drawn at the left side is current demand. It is usually from very huge companies who has millions on their annual research budget, like Fortune 500. Yet, there are always were a lot more clients, a lot more companies who really wanted but could not afford market research because that, it was so expensive. So here comes Open Survey. We are providing market research that is affordable for not only red side, but also blue side. Even though the research project revenue is smaller in blue John, the wrong tail clients number is so big. So the opportunity we are uh, in fronting is really huge. The size of red John itself is $30 billion annually, and I is we estimate that blue John is almost equivalent to the red John, the current demand. So the total addressable market opportunity is 60 billion annually around the world. So the solution, we have open survey and we have two major product component. First one is mobile application where we can collect the customer responses through at their native application. Uh, we have quarter million mobile panelist network in Korea. So when our clients want to conduct specific survey, we can uh, send the push message to the targeted panelist. And the second component is a full stack analytics engine on the web user interface. So not only the data visualization, but also deeper analytics can be done without any handling of statistics software. It is all okay. It, is, it goes through the web user interface. So through these innovations, we could complete a nationwide market research within three hours and only for $1,000. So this is how we did after an initial launch. When we launched at the end of 2011, we had very significant growth afterwards. In fact, our second quarter of revenue this year is 12 times higher than last year. And we are forecasting a multi-million dollars in annualized revenue within the next couple of months. What's more, we aggregate 400 corporate clients, including 3M and Johnson & Johnson, to name a few. Due to this solid growth and solid customer base, we could close successful Series A funding from SoftBank and Sunbridge Capital in Korea. So I want to share how it works. Uh, for, first of all, I want to apologize for a couple of screenshots after this slide is in Korean, because we are working very hard on localization right now, but yet not finished. So uh, let's suppose you, are, you want to conduct a customer satisfaction survey like this, because we provide dozens of survey templates you can make your own survey with several clicks. So select the survey type and type in the keywords. That's it, your survey is ready. And after you select the targeting, 
it auto our system automatically sends a push message to the targeted panelists, and our panelists respond in real time through their mobile devices. That, that's why we accomplish so fast a nationwide market research. And this part is the basic, our uh, basic research page. We provide both um, report in PDF format, and we also provide Excel, file, Excel, for, Excel types uh, raw data like this. And all these reporting features are automatically um, operated at the back end side. And we also provide the deeper analytics through our web UI, like this. Yeah, can you turn the page? <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah, like this, you can adjust the weight through the browser interface. So it automatically demonstrates the difference between the overall average and the weighted average like this. And you can also uh, add the personalized banner and it automatically, automatically um, updated to the cross table at the bottom of the analytics page. And you can export it uh, uh, to Excel file format very easily. So two years ago, we started Open Survey in Korea and a quarter and, a, and last May, we started Open Survey Asia in Japan, and we successfully uh, recruited a couple of reference clients, including GUI. And today, we want to expand this customer base to North America who are interested in Korean market. Because Korea has the world's third largest Android market, so uh, more and more companies are interested in Korean American research. So for now, we are the best way, we are, we are the best way to understand Korean market, and as a next milestone, we are targeting to expand our panelist network outside Korea and becoming the best way to understand Asian market. Thank you. Um, pretty cool. Uh, question on distribution, how do you get panelists? Because one of the challenges is to figure out of you know the, popu the general population, who would be the right target for a given survey? Mm -hmm. And one of our companies, Servada, actually does that by essentially partnering with different uh, publishers that gear toward, gear towards demos, psychos, geos, which are different, and then targeting them. So yeah. they, they use the ads. Oh, sorry, surveys as ad uh, ad um, units. So how do you guys do that? Um, we are utilizing very many ways to recruit our panelists. We are using 35 and more channels actively every day. And uh, it combines of online and mobile and offline. We have a partnership with several um, offline restaurants. So when some, someone goes into the restaurant and they install our application and become our panelist, they can be free soda on it like this. So we utilize a lot, as many channels as possible to make a random sample, to master sample, like our uh, being mobile panelist group. Do you, do you plan to stay, like you closed with the best way to understand the Asian market. Are you, is, are you planning to just kind of stick to Asia or are you? Um, for now, we are, uh, what, we are, what we can provide right now is only Korean American research. But uh, afterwards, we are uh, considering very seriously about other Asian emerging markets, not uh, North American market itself. But if there is, where there, if there is some strategic investors or strategic partnership with us to expand this model to North America, it would be much appreciated. So I would just say uh, to Jeff's earlier point, I don't know how many people in the room, but at least in the US, uh, Google has a product uh, using kind of some of the methodologies that Jeff mentioned uh, for co consumer surveys, it's a new ad unit of double click. Uh, so I think you should take that very seriously, at least for Asia. Um, you know, with Google having that product and SurveyMonkey being here, even though it's not a direct competition, um, I would say it's probably going to be a little bit tough, tough here. However, you do have one advantage that clearly, like, localizing this is not trivial. And so uh, I, I think you do have a strategy to at least dominate the Asian market. Other than having an office in Japan, do you have any present traction there, any panelists? Um, not for now. Okay. You, you're, you're working on it? Yeah, that's right. Okay. My only other um, feedback on just your pitch is it, 
it, it kind of started to, it, I started to lose a little bit of interest until you, you got to where your traction was. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, you should put that right from the beginning to get everyone's attention. Yeah. I mean, you, right. you are making, you said millions, a million something run rate, annual mm -hmm. run rate, and you have some big brands on board and you already had closed significant funding with some big VC, like that should be in the front. I Just totally agree, like right. too much scene setting. I think we all know market <laughs> research is awful. Um, I think that, um, I guess my question on the, I totally agree that like it makes total sense to be focused on the Asian market. It's a market that a lot of big brands want to understand, and you know there. I do feel like there's more companies taking a, an approach like this here. Um, when you, I mean, going from Korea to Asian market, like that seems a big jump. Like, are where in Asia are you prioritizing? You're doing Japan. Are you mm -hmm. looking at India? Are you looking at China? I mean, like. That seems an almost incomprehensibly huge jump to me. Oh yeah, that is very valid point. And uh, we are really considering um, Japan as the next market because we have an investment firm SoftBank and not only from SoftBank, but also we also have a lot of inquiries from Japanese companies who want to make a joint venture or a joint partnership, utilize our platform in their country. And the second one, second reason is if if we want to flourish the mobile research in specific country, the smartphone penetration matters. So Japan is the second largest smartphone population are there in Asia, and that's why we are considering Japan as the next market. And can you tell us just a little bit about your team? Um, when we start, we were most most of us were engineers, so uh, so we were most likely serving monkey when we started, but uh, we. Um, after struggling in the market for maybe six to nine months, we figured out that we should bring researchers inside to provide a better market insight to our clients. So uh, for now, we have 30 people in Seoul headquarters, and half of us are engineers, and half of us are businessmen and researchers in traditional, uh, who had experience in traditional research companies. Um, yeah, the last one I wanted to make is that um, since uh, we're supposed to um, uh, rate you on the team and the traction, it, uh, it would be great to have you know, that in the slides. And you know, the, that kind of very slow setup of the market after lunch, you know, to snooze, it's great. Right. So uh, you want to sort of speed that up and get traction. This is what we're doing. This is, this is why it's interesting. All right. Because what you, I mean, you, what you guys have built in terms of roster of clients is really impressive. I would put that first slide. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. Okay, so the next uh, startup we have here is Cult Story, and uh, Matt, the CEO, will be presenting. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Kwan. I'm the CEO of Cult Story, the makers of Travelog. And we're changing the way that we discover and share travel information. Oops, sorry. Can you guys? Uh... This is how we receive information today. Whether we're looking for the latest fashion trends on Pinterest or reading up on the news on Flipboard, we expect these applications to be engaging, visual, and customizable. But what's that experience like when we search for travel information? Well, it looks like this. It's scattered. It's visually uninspiring. It's often irrelevant. What's on the other end of that Google link? And our TripAdvisor and Yelp reviews really align with our own personal tastes. It's not so much that there isn't enough information available, but it's extremely difficult to find the travel information relevant to you. So we decided to build Travelog, a platform that makes it extremely simple to discover and share captivating travel moments based on your personal preferences. Like most photo-centric applications, our users browse photos, but it's once they press a photo where the magic happens. You see, they're instantly connected to a real-life travel moment. 
with real life emotions and real life experiences, all shared by everyday travelers like you and me. It's this access to real and genuine information, as well as the ability to engage directly with like-minded travelers that keeps our users coming back for more. But we've also made Travelog more personalized and flexible. Most travel platforms today force you to search their content by a destination. But let's say, for example, you have no clue where you want to go. But what you do know is you're planning a trip with your girlfriend or boyfriend. Well, Travelog connects you with other romantic and loving moments from other traveling couples from destinations all over the world. Or maybe you're a travel junkie looking for your next adrenaline rush. Well, just take a look at some of these amazing moments. Travelog makes it extremely simple to find the travel content most relevant to you. Now let's take a look at some of our numbers. We currently have 37,000 logs and over 55,000 photos have been uploaded. But more importantly, we're present in 160 countries that span across 6,000 cities. We launched our biggest update three months ago and since that time, our members have grown 40%. But how can we make our experience even better? We think we can do this by getting to know our users even more. Let me introduce you to one of them. This is Meg. We've noticed that she calmly tags friends, son, and adventure. This gives us an idea of who she's traveling with and what are some of her interests. But we also know where Meg wants to go next, and we get this through our bucket list feature, where Meg has added Bangkok, Manila, and Kuala Lumpur. So what can we do with this information? Well, let me show you. This is the new Travelog Discover feed, a feed that will look different for every user on our application. This is what Meg's looks like. Through our automated recommendation engine, we're able to highlight other logs with tags of similar interest. And with our new partnership with TravelZoo, we're able to offer Meg an amazing package to Manila, hopefully making that dream trip to the Philippines more of a reality. And lastly, we highlight the Grand Palace, an amazing tourist attraction in Bangkok. Meg gets inspired by this, and she not only gets access to user travel logs, but she also sees TripAdvisor, Foursquare, and Yelp reviews, as well as gets access to the Grand Palace's Facebook page. But travel log is not just great for users looking for content. It's also great for travel brands. You see, we take inspirational moments and turn those into moments of action. And what this means for our strategic partners and our advertisers is more sales. With our current partnerships today, our users can book hotels, vacation packages, and also get access to daily deals. We take our users from the point of discovery and stay with them even when they're at the destination. And this is the team that's making it all happen. We're a team of coders, designers, and hustlers, and we're all connected with our passion for travel. And we're also looking to raise our seed round. We have a very aggressive roadmap over the next six to 12 months. Uh, we're primarily focusing on growing across new platforms, launching new marketing objectives, and also accelerating our revenue models. If you think that you'd like to be part of our journey, please get in contact with us. Again, we're a team called Story, and Travelog is changing the way that we discover and share travel information. Thank you. Um. So I have a lot of questions and thoughts. I, if there's any space I'm more obsessed with than mother apps, it's travel apps, because I spent two years traveling the world, and I like pretty much hate almost every single travel site. Um, so I think you're right that it's a like horrific user experience. But I think the reason why it's such a bad user experience isn't because there's not good designers working on travel. It's because it is really hard to display the complexity of information that people want to see. Um, you know, not every traveler optimizes for the same thing. Um, even if you're just doing it off optimizing on cost, um, there's, you know, so many hotels and there's so many locations. And it is, it, particularly boiling that down to a mobile environment is just like an incredibly hard thing to do. And I think the only way it works is having really good personalization. And like my biggest problem, well, I, I had two problems with your pitch. I, I like a lot of things. I think. Your instincts about why the market's broken, totally right. I like that you have the tiles that flip because I think it's a really nice way to get a lot of things on one screen without having to pick just four images to show someone, and I like the, the UI. I think what concerns me is the personalization did not seem that robust to me. I mean, I don't know anyone who wouldn't say they like to have adventures with friends in the sun. Like, I mean, who's like, I only want to travel with people I hate 
when it's freezing cold. Like, that doesn't tell me that much. And, like, just tagging stuff, it's, like, that doesn't really seem like it's getting you personalization. Like, for this to work, it needs to be, like, spooky accurate. Like, how did you read my mind and know that I wanted to go to Bangkok? Because I shouldn't have to tell you I want to go to Bangkok. So, like, to me, that's the killer thing that no one's doing in mobile. And it doesn't seem like you've cracked that yet. I also think towards the end of your presentation, it's, you, it just seemed like you were trying to kind of be everything to everyone. And again, I think travel is so complex if you're trying to do one thing that like really like try to solve one part of this and become indispensable. Like this is why Hotel Tonight just raised a ton of money from a hedge fund and they actually think they could be a public company because it is the most simple, boiled down, we are doing one. And that's why people love it because travel's overly complex and horrible, so. I, one pet peeve in your presentation, like I think you were showing your metrics, but I just, I don't like it when companies, I see so you had a lot of different metrics, but I assume like members, downloads, or active users is a, a pretty key metric for you, and you didn't really mention that until I see it in really tiny print here, but then you did say you have 40% growth, but when you throw around like growth percentages and you don't say what the actuals are, it's like, did you go from zero to 40 or I, I, ever whatever? So that's just, I, I would, that's just, it's a little misleading when you do that, but um, yeah. I think it was a very visually pleasing presentation and I'm also like huge travel fan. Um, one thing that wasn't really clear to me is like, I don't know if Meg was a real user or not, but distribution and virality is gonna be really interesting. I mean, to um, uh, Sarah's point, uh, unless you solve a very critical part of the travel problem, it's gonna be hard to get that initial thing. Like, I think if you had 10 million users already, sure, or like 50 million users, I can see how this interface would be appealing, but if you're starting from scratch, um, you know, you're gonna have to be not like 10%, but like 10x better uh, of stuff that's out there. So I, I do know that you guys have talent, clearly. It's a very visually pleasing product and presentation. I just was a little bit in the dark in terms of, you know, the virality and distribution aspect. And I just think, like, focus, because, you know, uh, just trying to, like, peop there have been so many travel apps that are focused around social and, like, focused on sharing moments and inspiration and what are your friends doing and we all love travel and we love to travel together. And, like, I mean, we did a story six months ago about how, like, ten of them are out of business. Like, social travel has not worked as a category. And it's not to say it can't, but it's, like, I think solving a utilitarian travel pain point is where you want to focus versus, you know, again, kind of like the first presentation, capturing moments, things that really people are just already doing on other social platforms. Yeah, it's a very consistent uh, feedback. I think the only interesting travel companies that have emerged over the past couple of years would be um, sort of Hotel Tonight and Hipmunk. And when you think about those two, you go like, really, you're building a company around that? Is that sort of, is that such a big deal? And the answer is yes, because travel, you know, so booking, tr hotels booking, flights sucks. And if you can find a way to solve that pain point really, really well, then you will be able to scale, provided that your distribution strategy uh, works. And Hotel Tonight had to spend a ton of money to get that footprint, but hey, it's working. And to me, what wasn't super clear is, when do I use this? Pre, you know, when I'm planning, when I'm thinking, when I'm sort of traveling there, trying to find, you know, the restaurant or, you know, the, um, the museum to go visit, it wasn't sort of super clear what was the use case they were trying to solve. And if it's not clear, then why would I download it? Because that's, that's the whole issue. Getting people to download your app is such a challenge today. And it's so expensive that you can't just randomly you know, acquire users because one day they searched you know, for a travel destination. Uh, just to respond, um, when you're speaking about uh, you know, sort of sticking to one thing. So originally we just looked at well what's the expectation when you go to google and you search something or if you know you're you're a mother of five or your group of college friends and you're searching on TripAdvisor, it, it's the the reality is it's not that great right the experience isn't so good you spend a lot of time searching for that um more and more people are moving over to mobile to search for this content just because like other applications it, it's just convenient right it's convenient to do so for us to sort of uh think that we're gonna be perfect at it, it's not, it's not what, what we're saying. What we are saying is, 
in a mobile environment, what, what's available today? There isn't much. It's really, really frustrating. We tried to, like you touched on design. It's designed it that way so that people can get snippets and get that engagement quicker. Uh, how we want to be different from, say, other social platforms, like you mentioned, like Pinterest or Instagram, is that when you go into one of our, our user logs, you know what it is. It's, it's, it's a real life user moment. It's a, it's a snippet of someone's vacation. Where on the other end of Pinterest, you don't know what that is. Is it a broken link or, or what are you getting from it? So we're trying to add a consistent uh, user experience, like Jeff, like you mentioned too. Why are you coming here? What are you doing? Our users are divided into two, right? Content providers, people who love to share, and then people looking for that information. Uh, when they go to access that information, uh, you know, we, we really leave it up to them. It could be planning. It could be once you get there, you have, you, you're not sure. Because travel planning today is getting shorter and shorter. People just don't plan anymore. And they don't want to spend hours on their uh, desktop searching for this stuff. So we, we do feel like our platform uh, hits up on a couple of use cases. And I understand what you mean, that it's not crystal clear that there's just one. Uh, but I, I just, I would really try to focus on solving one problem. Sure. And then you can like, you know, there's a, like, for my company, there's so much I want to do over the next 10 years, but it's like, I'm trying, like, I'm, there's so much of that I'm not even doing right now, because like, if I don't do this, I can't do those things. And um, I think particularly for raising a million dollars, like, that's not that much money. And I just think, you know, you have to, like Jeff is saying, mobile distribution is so hard. You have to be able to say, I'm telling you in 30 seconds, like, why I, you have to download this app. And it's just being like, well, there's some people I don't know, some trip moment. It's just, it's like, it's not enough, like, 30 seconds, why am I telling my nanny why she has to download this, because it's amazing. But I like the UI a lot. Thanks. Yeah, half of the, I think, I don't, I'm not sure you're not sure, but I think about half of the money we raised at Blink was used um, to acquire, you know, users. And we were trying to do that on the pan-European basis, which is a really, which is a real nightmare. Because something that works in one part, one country doesn't work in the other, which is even, you know, worse. So the next one up is uh, Flitto and the CEO, Simon Lee. Good afternoon. You guys must be a little tired. So let me start my presentation with a little story. Or well, I don't have religion, but still, according to Bible, there has been a language barrier ever since the Babel Tower collapsed. Now this is year 2013. So now I can access like Japanese website or like Chinese website, maybe Arab website using my smart device here. But if I don't speak their language, what's the use? Which means there still is a language barrier. So a lot of people, they tried really hard to break down the barrier. And I'm sure that most of you here have used machine translation. So how was it? Was it great? You gotta be careful before you use machine translation because you're gonna bring <laughs> fire extinguisher when you go to a battlefield. <laughs> Let me introduce myself. My name is Simon Lee and I'm a founder of Fleeto, a platform that enables cross-sourcing translation all from your mobile phone. Literally, we translate any content from text, image, even a voice accurately, cost-effectively, and in almost real time, up to 14 different languages. And we're going to make it up to 18 different languages by end of this year. So how do we do it? As I told you, we don't use machine translation, because machine translation, it sucks. <laughs> so we do. We push right content to the right users, and we motivate them to add translation. What I mean is, when users they log into our platform, we automatically identify what kind of content they like and what kind of languages they speak. And if other users, they request translation, let's say text, if, or like recording their voice, or a photo just like this, we push right content to the right users so that they can translate. So users, they get push notification. We're gonna trans translate this from Korean to English. So not all of them, they do the translation. About 30%, they do the translation because they're doing nothing. And they use their mobile phone, and they do the translation within 30 seconds. And the user who requests the translation are who are gonna get pop-up notification. 
there's a new translation. Now what users, they have to do is like, they can choose the best translation. How do they know which one's best translation? They can get into a translator's profile and they can see the rate of the translator. So now, he gets the point. And the whole process actually takes less than three minutes. Like between English and Korean, it takes less than 30 seconds or less than a minute. And we apply this API on, into a social media, just like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And what happened is like Sai, he's now speaking 14 different languages on his Twitter. And he actually mentioned our service on his Twitter. And now you can read comics in different languages. It's, it's more like globalreddit.com or like globalnandgeek.com. And because their tweets been translated into 14 different languages, a lot of celebrities and big brands, they love using our API. Now Sai, Paolo Coelho, and the Chinese singer, Henry Lau, and Shiny, the K-pop singers, they keep on promoting our website on their Twitter. So we spend zero on marketing. And after a few months starting our beta service, we hit two million users and it's growing 25% a month. And users are from 170 different countries. And if you type Flito on Twitter right now, you're gonna see a lot of people talking about Flito every single minute. And they're actually comparing Flito with Twitter and Facebook or YouTube, which is great for us. So how you make, yeah, how you make money? A lot of people ask us. Just imagine what is going to happen in the future if we break down the language barrier, which has been there like forever. For example, commerce bar. See, if I sell my product, writing every information in Korean, only Koreans can buy this. But if I translate this into 14 different languages, those people who live in Silicon Valley, they can actually buy this, which means the price goes up. And we take 6 to 10% of the shares. We actually make money right now by doing this. And when you request translation, you can collect translation and use that, or if you don't have enough points, you have to buy points. And when you buy points, we take commission, about 20%. And above that, every single day, we collect 300,000 data posts. And a lot of big companies where they make machine translation, they, they're dying to take our database. So this is what happened when Google used our database. So this is a very simple sentence, but on the top is a Google Translate. As I told you, uh, is, it, is there like anyone from Google? Yeah, as I told you, Google Translate is uh, not correct here, but whenever they use our database, they come out with the best translation. So we're gonna, we, we are projecting to hit 10 million users by end of this year, and about 30% they do the translation, which means there'll be a three million translators on our platform, which is great. Uh, yeah, we are a tech stars network company, and uh, we started our company with two highly uh, talented programmers and me. I'm a business guy. And people, a lot of people, they ask me, why do you guys think you can do this better than anyone else? Well, we are Koreans, you know. We grew up in a part of the world where the uh, ability to understand other languages in a personal or business level is the difference between success and failure, which means we truly understand the language barrier. Isn't it true, right? So, uh, SI recommended you guys use Frito.com to read his tweets in your native language and enjoy the world beyond the world. Thank you very much. I, th I thought your presentation was really good. What's the real story with how you guys got Sai to tweet about you? Did he just discover it? Did you know someone? Well, no, no, we are small startups. Yeah, we don't have enough money for that. No, I know you said you didn't spend money, but like, does someone yeah. uncle, well, I, I someone's really uncle friends him. with yeah, so, Sai? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know, you know. My, na my last name is Lee and his last name is Park. And, uh, <laughs> I never met so, him So like, before. you just saw him tweeting about it? You know, every single week, you know, those Big stars, they are actually mentioning us. Even yesterday, JYP, he And they're just discovering it on their own. Yeah, because you know, we are translating their tweets into 14. Oh, actually, we are not doing it. Fans are doing it. But they're so happy about it because okay. they want to communicate with their global fans. So just a couple um, questions. Like, what's the motivation behind people doing the translation? So OK, we have different motivations. For like fans, when you do the translation, your rank goes up. And agencies like SM, like YG, like big agencies for the K-pop stars or like American pop stars, they send them like souvenirs, sign autograph. So they do that. 
they're so happy about it. You know, they do the translation for like an hour and they get a piece of paper after a month with their name on. And they're so happy. They're like, ooh, I got a piece of paper. <laughs> and for the uh, translation request part, when you do the translation, see, you're an amateur translator. You will never make money out of doing translation. But here, you can actually make money. This Indonesian girl, she does the translation 30 minutes a day. And after a month, she made $300 in our platform, which means even amateur, amateurs, they can make money. Are you paying them? No, I'm not paying. You have to buy points before you request translation, your personal translation, which is very low. It's like 50 points is like the minimum, po the minimum point, which is about 2.5 cents, which is nothing. So where's the money coming from? I'm sorry, I'm not so understanding. So when you, when you request translation, you have to pre-buy points using PayPal. Okay. So if you pay a dollar, we give you 2,000 points. So with, you have to pay to have your stuff translated. Right, but which is really cheap. So with 2,000 points, you can like request, how many times, about 40 times. So um, we clearly think that there is a market in translation, but I think it's on the professional aspect. Right. So we backed a company called Smartling that does translation for bigger sites. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I really appreciate, first of all, like, good job, I think, you know, good traction with zero uh, dollar spend. I think it was an original presentation. One pet peeve that I do have, because I worked at Google, people pick, like, the one in 10,000 scenario and say, oh, Google sucks, and we're so much better. The reality is Google is free. It can do 100 languages. It's going to keep getting better, like, machine-based. You just took that one example and say it sucks. And in reality, like, look, um, I think people underestimate the status quo. There's always this tendency to take this one example is like, oh, like, look at this, and we're going to be so much better. Um, and, and, but on the other hand, I think there's a lot of potential in this product. I think I would refine, uh, to, to Sarah's earlier point at the other company, focus a little bit. Uh, maybe Twitter is a good example for you, or like just you know focus on one angle of what is the core use of the product. Uh, I mean, I think there were a couple of really fun examples, including Sai, but it, it wasn't really clear to me like what is the main use of this product. Do people use it mostly for tweets, just the websites? Because even like Google search results, Google you can just say Google translates the website. Even if it's 50% accurate, I get the the idea of what they're doing. Right. Uh, well, actually, I said machine translation is sucks, and Google translation is not correct up there. And uh, well, see, Google translate you can't translate photos or like voice, right? But using our uh, application, you can actually translate voice and photos. And I guarantee that you're gonna get translation within three minutes, perfectly translated. So uh, for like short. What do you mean when you say guarantee? That you know we push it out to thousands of people. And you get like, I don't know, 30 to 40 translation within a few minutes. And among those translations, you know, you can find the best translation. And you can easily find the best translation because, you know, you're going to see the translators rank down it. So I had one question, which is, out of your existing usage, how much is text translation versus picture translation versus sp spoken translation? Because to your point, I don't, where I see is, uh, uh, sort of, we're in Korea. And we try, we, there is a sign, we don't know where, where, where we go, what to do, whatever. We snap a picture and then we get it translated. We don't know if it's a hand grenade or candy or... And so, I think that for the traveler, provided that you have the app, which is the same issue, how do you get the freaking app on your phone, there is actually some applic applicability. And I really appreciate the, the crowdsourced angle, and I'll let you answer the question. Um, and that reminds me, when I saw Vicky, we just got acquired for 200 and I thought, who would bother doing the translation of all that text, what the hell, right? And guess what, you know, they were right, I was wrong. So I think that there is definitely an opportunity, but it's not really sort of super crisp as to what use case, what, you know, uh, sort of, is it the travel, is it, you know, what, what, what will get this to become interesting and bigger than Vicky? And I think you gotta do a free version. I think there's, even if it's really cheap, the points are confusing, it is really hard to get people to pay a fraction of a penny versus free. So actually, 70% uh, of our users, they, um, translate, they, they, they request translation with their photos. They go traveling and take a photo of the menu, and they ask for the translation. And like rest of like 20%, they do ask for the translation for the text, other 10% for like voice. And uh, most of the users right now are like, uh, for like request translation function, it's like little kids for like uh, high school students or like college students. Because you know, they have to do their homework and it's due, like, it has due date, right? And it's like playing all day, like for uh, next day French class, he or she has to do finish her homework and they just request translation. 
and within like a minute, she'll get the translation. So she asked her mom to pay a dollar, and um, they get the translation just by that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think, you know, that's actually a good market. You said you had two million users. You mean two million, um, is this mobile only, or? No, is we have just... a web version, and, oh, okay. uh, yeah. And, so when uh, you say users, are you referring to just, um, like, like registered users or downloads or like and how yeah, many of so those are actually act like active about like uh, 700,000 they, they download application and other like uh, cuz you know we we launched our applications like a few months ago okay and and a lot of people from Indonesia they use our uh, service and they don't carry smartphones so they use a web version yeah i tend to agree like what folks have said like it's it's good for you to really define what's the core use case in the target customer because let's say if it's travel it seems like something would be very temporary, like you'd use it when you're traveling, but then, you know, once you're, assuming you live in a country for a longer period of time, maybe you'll start to pick up the language and you don't need it as much, I don't know. But it seems like something, it wouldn't be something that people would use all the time. So that's kind of like the danger of having a leaky bucket of customers, so that's why. I've, and then you mentioned Psy and Twitter and um, that being another use case, but it's just kind of like, we should focus on something. And the commerce one, I thought the commerce one was interesting because, um, you know, there is, like, mobile, it's not just that the problem hasn't been solved, which is what you said at the beginning, which I think is true, despite Google's best efforts. Um, it's also that mobile first world has made everyone international on day one. So to me, the problem is intensified. But, um, so, like, I think you have, like, three really interesting um, use cases of what you could focus on, but it's, like, pick one. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Erin, um, representing Between. I'll just wait for my slides. Okay. So before I start, um, I want to ask you a question. Um, are you in love right now? <laughs> um, I think if I looked close enough, I can tell who's in love or who recently fell in love in this room because you start to show some signs. <laughs> like. You're constantly checking your phone, or you're constantly messaging someone, and you have this big smile on your face when you do it. And you do this when you're in love, because when you're in love, you constantly miss that person. You always want to be with him, and you always, have wanna, you always wanna have this time just between the two of you. And we thought these couples need to be together all the time, and have this quality time between just the two of you should translate from offline to mobile space. So that's why we made between. So while other social media, they focus on making as many connections as possible, we um, decided to find the most important relationship and make it even stronger through emotional mobile communication service. And let me explain that in terms of feature. So first we build a one-on-one -on -one connection and the first feature is chatting. So it's like instant messaging, just like Facebook chat or WhatsApp. And we have stickers and emoticons um, customized for couples to help you express your feelings. And the second feature is photo album. I believe this is what differentiates us the most from other social media or messaging apps. Because couples, they share a lot of memories together and they wanna look back on them and interact around them. But there's no easy way to do that in a private way on a mobile right now. So if our users share their photos on between, we automatically arrange them by date. Um, so you can easily search back and rediscover your memory. You can leave comments on them and interact around your memory. And the third feature is anniversary reminder, so you don't forget each other's birthday or upcoming date. And the last feature is memo board. This is for longer messages. Um, some people use this to write a bucket list for them or um, just sweeter memo after they've had a fight. <laughs> it works really well. Um, and we've been around in the market for a little less than two years, um, and we grew really fast. So as of now, we have more than 4.2 million downloads and more than 1.3 million active users, and that's all organic. Um, every day, there are 28 million messages sent across our platform, and our average user, they spend 450 minutes per month in our app. So compared to last August, so within just one year, we more than 4 x our number of downloads, and because we are constantly improving our service, um, per user spend time and per user activity, such as number of messages, also increased by more than 40%. And there are many reasons to focus on couples as target users, but one big reason for us was monetization capability. 
And let me tell you a hypothetical, let me ask you a hypothetical question to kind of prove, prove that. So think about your average Facebook friend and your potential between partner. And think about how often you actually meet or have dinner together, whether you ever exchange gifts or whether you will ever consider marrying that person. We believe that the more meaningful relationship that is, the more likely you are to spend money for that person or spend money together with each other. So our business model is really simple. We want to help couples find um, good and relevant deals for their next date or you know, suggest new gift ideas for their birthdays. And while doing that, we believe that we can help businesses deliver highly targeted and couple-specific marketing messages in the most effective way. While I believe there are many industries who might want to do this, this is not the only example, but a very good example is wedding industry. So in the US alone, there are 2.5 million couples getting married every year. And in US, Korea, Japan combined, it's $70 billion industry. And not only wedding, fine jewelry industry, fine dining and travel industries, they are all driven by couples and couples are um, very big purchasers in, this, in these industries. So basically what we want to be is a platform for love. So whenever couples need to use smartphone to communicate with each other, we want them to do it on between. And while doing that, we want to offer the right monetization model to our partners in relevant industries. And because love is something universal, uh, we are already growing organically all around the world. But we believe that having the right partnership really helps. So. <laughs> I, I love Mad Men, I had to put that as a reference. So yeah, please talk to us, give us your honest feedback. Let's talk about what we can do together. Um, I'll, be, I'll be at this conference until the end of it, so I would love to talk to you. So last but not least, if you're in love, use between. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell whether I'm in love or not just by looking at me. I can tell by the sparkle on your left hand. <laughs> <laughs> I can That's tell you're in love. Um, first of all, I, I thought the opening of your presentation was really good. It really sucked us into what you're doing and I think showed some passion with what you're doing. So I, I think you're a good presenter and you did a good job there. Um, I, I, like, I love the messaging space space and I love, like we're doing a special report now on Pando called Anti-Social Networks. Like I actually love networks that are totally orthogonal to social networks and don't rely, I think they're really hard because they're inherently unviable, but it's a really interesting um, space. I think, so, so some of this I really liked, but it's like the more you went on, like the more you lost me because I just think again, this is like so broad. And a lot of the things that you're saying that you're gonna do for people, like I am gonna use Yelp or OpenTable to book a restaurant. It doesn't, like, it doesn't matter that I'm like chatting somewhere. It's so easy to go back and forth on my phone. I just, I don't think I need a relationship portal. I just think that kind of, that web vocabulary doesn't really work in a mobile age. Um, so I would focus on like one of those things to like really own and hone in on. And like for me, chat, like my husband and I m and message on Snapchat all day long. And like, I love the disposableness of it, the spontaneity, the, you know, I can see a picture of my kids. He can draw like a smiley face on it. You know, it's, and, and the fact that it feels very personal and just between us. So like, I'm not sure there's enough uniqueness in messaging, like given other messaging platforms. I think making reservations is hard. I think there's probably something around the deal space that's interesting. I think there's, I think the photo album is actually really interesting because I think the permanence of that is orthogonal to the temporariness of Snapchat. So like I can see elements of what could be interesting, but like, like we've said to the other people, like you have to have like a clear pain point that you're solving or it's like I can kind of already do these things and other things. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, congrats on the 4.2 million downloads, but two things that were not clear to me, like is that in Korea or global, or what's the mix of it? And then also, how many of these people are still active after three months or four months? Like, you know, not just like one week, but a decent amount of time. Are they still engaging with the app and opening it and using it? Yeah, so um, answer your question about the geography first. Um, a little less than 60% of our users are in Korea, and growth outside of Korea is much faster than growth inside Korea. So we believe that the ratio is going to go down even more. Um, and uh, 
uh, rolling retention is really good. Um, I don't know what specific numbers I should give you. Um, we have 1.3 million monthly active users. Um, most of our users stay in our app after three months. Um, our daily churn rate after it's stabilized is less than 1%. It's 0.3%. I know you guys are, uh, most of your user base is in Asia, um, and I don't, like what we had talked previously, you, you are thinking of, you know, eventually down the road, um, expanding into, like, North America, outside of Asia. Um, I can totally see this type of app working in Asia, but, like, why do you think it is, like, what do you think you would need to change, or what, what do you think you would need to think about if you were going to try to enter the U.S. market? Uh, I, I thought it was really interesting that she mentioned um, Snapchat, because we are almost anti-Snapchat because, you know, some people want the photos to evaporate, but some photos you want it to stay. And um, you really want to share it privately. And I think that need is also universal and that need exists in the States. Um, so we want to, that's the context we want to offer um, to the US users as well. So you're right, we are focusing on communication because we want, we want them to be daily active. We want them to be active enough. And I think messages, messaging is the best way to do that. But we also offer photo as our second main thing that we are focusing on. And we want them to rediscover their memory in the easiest way because that's what differentiates us the most. So if you ask me what's the one thing that I'm focusing on for global usage, there will be actually photos and rediscovery of that. So um, about a year ago, 18 months ago, there was a hot application called Pear. And I don't know what happened with it, but it never made any sense to me. Because yeah. you have enough, I mean, I've been married for um, 20, actually 21 years yesterday, and I forgot to actually um, say happy oh, no. birthday. <laughs> you need Oops. this app then. <laughs> Let's hope you're not a typical example. But the point is, um, you have several tools. Yeah, well, you know, I figured it out last night. Um, you have several tools that help you be productive in your relationship. So it could be sort of, Snapchat or SMS or whatever, and you use those channels because at the end of the day, you know, you try and, and get things done pretty quickly. Um, and what Pear tried, which I thought was interesting, was, you know, those sort of thumb gestures that, that you know, you could exchange for having a, you know, five-second moment with your loved one, which I actually sort of buy, but they never got to a scale that, that, you know, made any sense. And I think they had a lot of usage, and then, you know, after three months or whatever, they just dropped and people never came back. So the issue is data retention, engagement, and what else you can do that either provides some utility or just this sort of moment that you want to have with your loved one where you want to say, hey, I love you. And I wonder, too, like, what part of the relationship you should really target, because, like, those early couple weeks are totally different in terms of what people want versus, like, if you're, like, Jeff or I and you've been married for, like, a jillion years and now forget anniversaries and, like, probably hate each other more than like each other most days. Um, I have two no. young kids. Did I mention that? <laughs> I'm about, speaking for all. myself. <laughs> we don't have any sleep. But like, I, I do think it is like fundamentally a different yeah. use case if it's like the early moments of love versus like someone you've really built a life with. And I think there's pros and cons with each. I think, for instance, there's going to be a lot of churn because people are going to break up way more. But people are going to be way nicer and want to do more things for each other. So like a, again, mm -hmm. like really honing in on like, you know, people, people see this and they're like, yes, that's for me. Yeah. So uh, one, one quick thing to add, I've been only married, it's actually gonna be seventh year this year and I have not forgotten about the anniversary, so that's a good thing. 21st, 21 years, years, years you Wait know, 13 that years, a different dude. story. Uh, Jeff was thing, good at seven um, years too. Clearly there must be something in the app that you had 4.2 million downloads. The reason why I asked where it is, like, uh, like Sarah said, I think in different places, the futures might not make as much sense. Like the reason why I'm like glad I've been to Korea six times, I would never go on a date to a gaming place and play computer games together or whatever. Clearly, that's really popular in Korea. Like, there are cultural differences. The other thing is, like, I, I think, again, coming back to critical use and focus, what is the most essential aspect of the app? Like, there's so, so many features in it. And then, you know, it might be that maybe the couples that are downloading are the ones that are not in the same city or whatever. You know what I mean? There is maybe something there that is not quite captured in the slide. Because you, you're doing 20 million, 20 million messages a day. Is that it? Yeah. That's a lot. That, that's that's, a lot, that's yeah. the stat that I was blown away about. Because if you have 1.3 million uh, daily, you know, DAUs, that means that, you know, they exchange north of 20, 20 messages per day. Uh, that helps because, um, you know, our two biggest market is Korea and Japan, and they're very text heavy in general. So you can see that from, you know, the success of Kakao and Line. Mm -hmm. So they already message each other a lot. 
and we carved out the group of consumers that talk to each other the most anyway. So all of our users, they don't use Kakao or Line when they're talking to each other. They do it on between. So we sort of got the most activities from that. So I guess that helps. And um, yeah. And well, about and I got to cut because oh. we, we, we're way past over time. But I want to thank our judges. You know, they, they've been phenomenal. It's been a, a great. Uh, thank you for coming. And thanks.